essentially creative energy and sexual energy are life force energy. They're different expressions of life force energy. When, if you think about creation, from a sexual standpoint, you were created from sex. There, there is sexual energy involved in the creation of most, most humans. And the, when we talk about creative energy, when we talk about that, it is the same as creation. You are creating something, you are birthing something, and yet it is just not in the realm of sexuality. And so they both stem from this life force, the life force of all creation, and that energy when pointed at at sex or sexuality becomes sexual energy, but that same spark when pointed in the direction of creating something that's not sexual becomes creative energy. Namaste, it's Sahara Rose, and welcome back to the Highest Self Podcast, a place to discuss what makes you your soul's highest involvement. If it's your first time listening, welcome. I am so deeply grateful to have you here. And if you're here all the time, then welcome back to another juicy episode. If you aren't aware, I'm actually recording all of these in video at the same time, including the intros now, so you can actually watch the full video on Spotify or on YouTube, which I highly recommend so you can get the full experience. We can be looking eye to eye, connecting, and for you to feel Adam's poems that he's going to be sharing with us on the episode. So I've known Adam for a couple of years from really his poetry. He is an incredible spoken word artist, and one of his poems has gone extremely viral around the world, over 200 million plays, and it's about self-love. So in this conversation, we dive into the realm of creativity and how it relates to sexuality, to self-love, to relationships, and so much more. He shares with us his creative process. He has a four-step process on how to really unlock your creativity. And I also ask him how to overcome different fears that we may have. You know, for myself and Dharma Coaching Institute, coaching hundreds of students and becoming certified spiritual life coaches, I see that the missing thing that's holding so many of us back is, well, I don't want to share my story, or I feel like my story is not interesting, or I don't know how to share my story, or can I not share it? So we really talk about the importance of vulnerability and how this can help really give life to your story and why it is a necessary piece of the puzzle. So all the creative things we really break down in the first half of this episode. Then we move into the sexuality and relationship realm where we speak about mm, open relationships and polyamory and his thoughts on it, what to do if someone you're interested in is polyamorous, but it's not feeling right for you. Is it coming from a fear? Should you move into it? We discuss both of our perspectives on this. We also dive into sexual shame and trauma and how that can be holding us back. He shares his experience going to sex camp and what that was like for him also opening up into his creativity. We really dive into how our relationship are catalysts for our spiritual growth. But then we also talk about how often in the spiritual community, he opens up that sometimes spiritual men are like, I'm sick of dating spiritual women. And I share how sometimes spiritual women are like, I'm sick of dating spiritual men. And where does this come from? And what is the thing? And how relationships are also different. Like some relationships do more processing for some people that's extremely weird. And all the perspectives in between that. So if creativity and sexuality, relationships, poetry, artistry are your things, you are going to love this conversation. I'm so excited to share it with you. Sharing your voice is such an important part of living your dharma, your soul's purpose, which is really my mission here to activate our soul's purposes. And we can't do so without opening up that throat chakra and allowing ourselves to speak our stories, our our visions, our messages, to to share those lessons learned to other people. And there really is such a gift and an art in that that I also share in my Speak With Soul course. So if you are interested in diving deeper into this journey, be sure to head over to speakwithsoul.com for more information about how to speak with soul. 
So this conversation is going to take you on quite a journey. Be sure to have an open heart, take a deep breath. And we're actually going to begin this conversation with one of his beautiful poems, the poem that I mentioned about self-love. So I invite you to just take a moment to drop in, to take a deep breath, receive the poem. And that's really going to allow us to sit into the vibrational field of receiving before this conversation begins. So let's take a deep breath together now. And without further ado, let's welcome Adam Ra on the Highest Self Podcast. And before we get started, I'd love to share with you this special offer. Are you ready to finally discover your soul's purpose, the big reason why you are here? Well, I've created a free masterclass experience for you where you will discover what your dharma is and how it may be different from your career, how to navigate through having multiple passions, different ways to transition into your dharma, ways to overcome people pleasing and caring what other people think, my number one tool whether knowing a decision is right for you, and journal prompts on the different types of resistance and how they show up for us. All of this is available for you for free in my Discover Your Soul's Purpose Masterclass. You can head over to IamSaharaRose.com slash masterclass to join today. Again, that's IamSaharaRose.com slash masterclass. And you can find that link in the show notes. I'm super excited to see you in there. You are who you've been looking for. So stop looking for more unless you're looking in a mirror because it's about time for you to see clearly that you are who you've been looking for. And that empty feeling you got, that hole in your chest, you only got that feeling because you think you're not blessed with everything you need. You see, we live in a consumerist society, which means they need you to buy stuff. And the easiest way to sell it is to tell you you're not enough. Buy this car, you'll get girls. Buy this bra, you'll get guys. And we're seeing it so much that we start believing these lies. But the truth is, the makeup they're selling to make you feel prettier is the same makeup you buy to stop feeling shittier about this lie they keep telling you that you are not enough. What about the movies we watch, all the shows on TV? The more I watch, the more I see. I need you to complete me. Huh. And yes, love is the answer. Love is the key. But if you can't love yourself, how can you ever love me? And loving yourself, what does that even mean? Like massages and selfies and that sort of thing? Because the more I think about it, the more it feels weird. I've always thought self-love was something to be feared. I've been taught that arrogance is bad and vanity, it's not good. And even my bracelets are telling me to act how Jesus would. So what should I do? How should I act? I'm supposed to love myself, but how do I even do that? Well, I got a trick that I picked up from a friend who noticed that I was quick to defend her when she would say something negative about herself. She'd say, I'm so dumb. And I'd say, you're so brilliant. She'd say, I'm so weak. And I'd say, you're so resilient. And when she said, I feel ugly. And I said, you look beautiful. She asked me why I was so dutifully filling up her cup constantly and yet treating my own cup so irresponsibly. Because when I looked in the mirror, my voice was quite clear. You're ugly, you're too thin, your hairline's receding and you got a pimple on your chin. And that was when she gave me a piece of advice that changed my life. She gave me a hug and she said, treat yourself like someone you love. Treat yourself like someone you love. And now I had been standing, but I needed to be sitting because I couldn't believe that I had been letting myself keep forgetting that I was who I'd been looking for. And deep in my core, I knew it was time to stop looking for more until I could look through all my fear and look into a mirror and see clearly that the man looking back at me is the only one who can make me happy and I am already enough. And I'm not any more special or unique than you. That's why I'm here to speak to you. You are already enough. And when you start to see that, you will start to be that. Your world will get brighter, your load will get lighter, and you can see that with life, you can be a lover, not a fighter, and that life, you deserve it because you are worth it. And there's no point in letting yourself keep forgetting because no matter what you say or do, you are perfect. 
And so today, I hope I leave you with a direction correction away from the flaws you see in your reflection. They aren't flaws to me. They are simply protection against all the doubts you have of your perfection. So start today. Take a good, long look in the mirror and say, I am who I've been looking for. Welcome, Adam, to the Highest Self Podcast. It's so great to have you here. I'm excited. Thank you for having me, Sarah. The first question I'd love to ask you is what makes you your highest self? Play. I think that play and by the thing, the reason why I say play is because play requires creativity. And I believe that our creative energy is the purest expression of our soul. And so when we are actually expressing our creativity, we're expressing our soul into the world. And when it's in the spirit of play, uh, it just amplifies where there's not necessarily the attachments to results or anything like that. It's just for the sake of doing Mm, I love that so much. And I feel like we both connect that we're like sacral chakra people. So we're like creativity, sensuality, expression, play. So can you speak a little bit how these energies and abundance are all kind of interconnected energies, creative energy, sexual energy, play energy? Yeah. So essentially creative energy and sexual energy are life force energy. They're different expressions of life force energy. When, if you think about creation, from a sexual standpoint, you were created from sex. There, there is sexual energy involved in the creation of most, most humans. And the when we talk about creative energy, when we talk about that, it is the same as creation. You are creating something, you are birthing something, and yet it is just not in the realm of sexuality. And so they both stem from this life force, the life force of all creation. And that energy, when pointed at at sex or sexuality, becomes sexual energy. But that same spark, when pointed in the direction of creating something that's not sexual, becomes creative energy. And I describe this in this way as well, because it's so important to find your turn on in life. What what about life turns you on? And most people hear that and they think sex, but what's the difference between being turned on sexually and being inspired? When you're creatively inspired, it's that same energy. It's that same life force coursing through you. It's just not pointed at a sexual target. And so um, for me, it's, it's what is that turn on in life that can fill me up with so much energy that I want to create. Mm, I love that so much. And, you know, I always see us as like walking orgasms, like all of us are <laughs> orgasms, you know, and we were our, our father's orgasm into our mother. And we're here like orgasming our expressions and our creativity and our dharmas. And it's all meant to just like ooze naturally through us from this place of not like, I'm trying to figure it out or, or in my head, but la- rather letting it move through. So I would love to know for yourself now as you know, you're living your dharma as an artist, as a poet, as someone who is playing and creating full time, which for a lot of listeners, like that is such a, a huge, just inspiration for them. How do you stay inspired when it's your work and you have deadlines and ways that you have to then like turn it into content to be seen and understood by other people? That is a great question. And it is a con- constant balance. You know, there, there is, to give you an idea, uh, two years ago at the very start of the pandemic, I launched something called the Create Community. And it's, it, it was something that was... I had hired a company to support me in planning my next poetry tour internationally, three month contract, et cetera. In the first two weeks, boom, pandemic. So everything is shut down. And that first month, no one knew what happened. I didn't know if we were in the walking dead. It was the end of the world, right? No one really had any idea what was going on. And so I, I just said, what do people need right now? They need a safe space to come together. And instead of canceling that contract, I took all of this firepower from these people and, and pointed it in the direction of launching this community, which over the last two years has been my primary focus. And, uh, that has had me put on my entrepreneur hat 
very heavily. The primary hat I've worn for the last two years has actually been my entrepreneur and building a personal development community and, and all these systems around that and content, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, at going into 2022, my inner artist was screaming, screaming at me and saying, okay, that's enough now. Where, where do I get to play again? And I think there is a balance. I'm always asking the question, how do I bring more of my creativity to what I'm doing? Um, but there are times, there are seasons. And I, I think I really do find it to be just the balance of the, the yin-yang energies, the masculine feminine energies. The, I, I believe that the structure of the masculine is incredibly important and, and valuable, especially as we are living in a very, uh, in many ways, the, the structure of, of the 3D reality that we live in is masculine. It is linear. It is one second, two second, three second, four second, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. We live in that sort of linear structure, uh, which is very masculine. And within that structure of time and, and uh, linearity, we see creation birthing through that. And that is the, that feminine energy. And so within ourselves, finding that balance of where we can bring our masculine and where we can bring our feminine and going back and forth and creating from that space. If we don't find that balance, I believe that we go off, off and see ourselves kind of fall down these rabbit holes of depression or uh, lack of fulfillment or burnout or overwhelm. And it's just our systems telling us, Hey, how, how about finding some balance? How about actually finding um, that center point where you feel equally expressed and cultivated and nourished in both your masculine and feminine energies? And I don't know that I have a secret other than starting with the awareness piece and having the awareness to notice, wow, my, my inner artist is screaming right now. And therefore I get to make some shifts in what I'm doing because it's time for another season, a different season. Mm, I love that so much. And I feel the same way with the different seasons and these different archetypes, you know, that live inside of us. And your artist is like, okay, I am one of your, you're probably your leading archetype. So yes, I also have the entrepreneur and yes, I have my, you know, teacher and all these different things. But if my artist doesn't feel free to express and have the space that it needs. I feel like that's such a huge thing with creativity of like when you have these really short deadlines or you just have like an hour in between something to actually allow that channel to open through. And at the same time, I know for myself, like with my last book, I didn't have, you know, I, I was running a business, the exact same thing. I, I had just launched my membership community. So I didn't have like all the time to just like channel my higher thoughts and to <laughs> break down those beliefs that I had of like, I need a full day of nothing in order to create and just let whatever can come through, come through at that time and then continue to, you know, evolve and edit and then receive new information from there. Mm -hmm. And I, I do think that, few people understand how much space creativity requires. The, the process of creativity is the process of your mind putting together patterns it's never put together before. And so I describe this like, imagine, you, you know, in those movies when they're, it's like a Mission Impossible eight and they're hacking into some bank or something. And they're always running this program that has this status bar that's letting them know how close they are to hacking into the system, which I'm not sure how a status bar lets them know that. But besides the point, as it's going, what it's doing is it's running this algorithm of millions, billions of different potentials, right? And uh, until it eventually lands on one. That's the process of creativity, the process of your mind going, well, I have this element and this element and pulling on past memories and past experiences and thinking of your vocabulary and blah, blah, blah. And it's just putting all these things together until you find a solution or you find an idea or you find the next step of your project. And it, it, imagine now you're trying to hack into that bank and you have 18 open tabs on, on the laptop that's running that, that hacking program, your, the processing speed slows down tremendously. So it's not that you can't be creative. It's just going to be far less uh, effective, far less efficient and take a lot longer. Uh, I know for myself, the, it's very difficult for me to go from three hours of 
Zoom meetings with my teams and being in like CEO mode and then say, okay, I have this two hour block right now. Let me jump into writing a poem. Just, it, it doesn't work that way for me or most people that I know. Creativity is not generally something you can fit in to a, a tiny window. Sometimes it may take an hour and a half for me just to get into the mindset where I can get 30 minutes of actual writing done. And then there's other days where I'll wake up and I'll write for three hours straight, just boom, 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 boom. And, and an entire poem can come out. Um, learning the process by which you create is one of the most important and powerful things you can do as a creative. Understanding what serves you the most, understanding uh, what key elements are, are going to be most conducive to you having uh, your creative spark and your creative vision. And uh, learning to feel into whether the creative muse, your, your inspiration is present or not. Because there have been so many projects that I think could have changed the planet, but people thought the muse left. And so they stopped when they got frustrated, when in reality, it was still present. It just required more of that algorithm hacking creative space. And then there's been other times where people have tried to force creativity when the muse is gone. The inspiration has gone, which means you don't actually have the elements in your brain to figure it out. You need to go and do something different because your brain is now like, we need, we don't have the ingredients, go out and watch some movies, go out and listen to some music, go on a hike, go take some mushrooms, go, you know, just go about your life and come back to this and learning to identify the difference between those two is, is a huge, huge piece of what any creative can, can gift to themselves. I so resonate with that. And even like our mediums of creativity changing over time. So when I started, I really identified as a writer and that was how creativity expressed through me. And then over like years of podcasting and creating video content, now I feel my creativity is best used when I'm speaking. It's just a faster channel for me that now, you know, in my head, I had it like, oh, you got to like keep writing books because that's what you're supposed to do. And like, that's what Deepak Chopra did. So keep writing. And it was, and then I came to this realization of, of I'm not expressing my best thoughts through writing anymore at this stage of my life. Maybe it will come back, maybe it won't, but just honoring the way that your creativity is seeking to express. And I love that. So do you have any tips for kind of knowing if the muse is still there and you just need to, to kind of change things up versus, okay, give it a break, come back to it later. Cause I, cause I see people messing up on both fronts. Yeah. I, I, it's not so much, it's funny because this, it always comes back to the body for me. It always comes back to the body. We could be talking about just about any topic. And if we're wanting to know where to find the guidance, come back to the body. And so learning how to identify what your creativity feels like, learning to identify what your creative energy feels like, learning to identify what your turn on your inspiration feels like. We all know what it feels like to be sexually turned on, but how many people know what it, it really feels like to be creatively turned on? Like what is, as, as, like, as a man, what does it feel like to have a creative erection, right? Like, what is that? And, and going to that experience um, in the body will be the number one indicator. And there's no way around this other than practice there's, there's the experiences that I had of trying to force my way through something and paying attention to how it feels in my body. And, and then there's times where I've wanted to stop and paying attention to how it feels to my body and realizing there's still something there. I can feel it. There's still something there and allowing myself the grace. And then when I realize after 30 minutes of sitting through that discomfort of feeling blocked, it came through like, Oh, okay. I was right. There was something there. And through those reference points, we develop a, a refinement the same way that as we walk through the world right now, and we talk about intuition, right? This, this thing about intuition. Yes, we all have intuition, but how many people recognize that intuition is also a skill. Like int intuition is something that we have, but developing your relationship to your intuition is a skill that can be developed over time and effort and, and putting in some attention and intention to that. Mm, I love that. So at this point, do you have a creative ritual or practice before you start creating, or is it more, you just 
let the energy take you when it's present? Well, I have a, a approach to creativity. It's like a four step approach to creativity um, that I can give just like the broad strokes of, because this is something that I'll, I'll teach over the course. I used to teach this in group programs. So you can really dive deep into this, but the, the idea is that for me, I believe in infinite realities. I believe that there are versions of reality in which I'm the host of this podcast and we're, we're switched and I live in your house and you live, you're in Costa Rica right now where I am. And then I, there's realities in which we've never met. There's realities in which we've had this exact conversation with only one word different, the infinite possibilities. And so when I recognize that those are all beyond time, right? That anyone who's had an experience of past lives or, or whatever, I think your audience is probably into this. And when you've had experiences that are quantum, that, that go beyond linear time and space, well, you recognize, okay, time is just, you know, the fourth dimension. It's not just this empirical thing that applies to everything. Beyond time is all of these realities. And I believe that we are pulling those realities through us and taking action upon them as we create them, same as being radio transmitters. We are transmitting a frequency out into the world, but we're also receiving a frequency. And so if you wanted to create, let's say I have a poem, right? If I'm creating a poem, am I pulling from the reality in which that poem never gets finished? Am I pulling from the reality in which that poem is, most people will go, oh, that's okay. Or am I pulling from a reality in which that poem goes on to reach 200 million people like you are who you've been looking for did. I think that the, the ability to do that is been in recognizing that the reality already exists and it's our job to essentially pull it through, to birth it into this reality. And I equate that to being a garden hose. We are a vessel for creative energy to flow through us and out and water the seed of a creative idea. And there's four steps to this. The first is if you pull a hose out from the shed, the first thing that anyone who has, you had to water lawns back in the day knows it's all kinked. It's all knotted and you have to unkink the hose before anything can flow through it. And that's the equivalent of all your fears, doubts, limiting beliefs, insecurities, et cetera, that are in the way of you even being able to receive that creative idea. If you believe that you can't sing, you have a terrible singing voice, your ability to receive the idea for a song that wins a Grammy, very low. And so those limiting beliefs and, and insecurities get to move through. That's unkink the hose. The second step uh, is connect to the tap, connect to the source. And that is what I was talking about earlier is where are you pulling that from? And this goes into very much law of attraction manifestation stuff. Like what is the feeling in your body, the emotional experience as you're creating? And then the third step is turn up the flow, which is what are the things that you do? Like you just asked about, what are the things that you do to get into a space where it is flowing freely through you as opposed to, um, you know, just being a little, a few drops at a time. And that can be your eating habits, your, your exercise habits. That could be the type of media you're consuming. That can be so many things. And then the fourth step is spout it out. And this is the equivalent of people with a hose. They could use their thumb on the end of the hose. They could attach a sprinkler to it or a gun nozzle at the end. What's the unique way that you want this creative energy leaving you and entering the world? And that goes into your, your unique story, your unique talents and gifts and skills, all of that. And so this is the four-step process that how I view creativity. And as a result to that, when I go into a creative project, let's assume it's like a big one, um, I'm going to be constantly viewing this as, okay, this is step one. And then I'm in step two. And then I got to go back to step one because it brought up a bunch of stuff. And then I go to step two. And now I'm on step three. Ah, man, I noticed this thing and I'm back to, you know what I mean? So I'm aware of where I'm at in the process so that I can kind of surf the wave. But in terms of actionables that I do, uh, the space is the most important thing and creating the space energetically in my body. And so that might look like in the morning I wake up and there's so much stuff on my mind and I want to write a poem or I want to whatever. I need to move my body. I need to move the energy. I need to clear the space 
so that I can actually receive. And so everything that I do is based off of these four steps and the idea that I can't actually be a vessel for it if I don't have space in me. And so most of my processes, whether it's listening to music, dancing, journaling, are in the spirit of moving energy out so I have more space. So, so good. And I'm so with you on the moving your body first thing. And I love how you've broken it down into these steps of, you know, I think so many of us, we associate creativity with that step three, the flow of like, why aren't I flowing? But it's like, have you taken the space first? Are you, have you unblocked yourself before that? Then are, what are you even tapped into? And then you can flow and then you can add your unique spin to it. So I love how that's broken down and And even as you progress in your creative journey, like you have, it's like, you keep coming across new blocks and new blocks. And you're like, oh shit, like that kink. I did not know about that. That was like nine feet in and it's showing up for me. So I'd love to know about vulnerability because I see a lot of people, what is scary about creating is, well, do I have to share my story? Can I share that person's story? Can I talk about something just from a hypothetic sense? And I know I felt that way too, when, when, writing my book, discover your Dharma. I'm like, can I just write about knowing your Dharma in general without having to share like my story because my parents are involved in all of this. And it just, it feels like a lot letting people know just those things that still feel messy and uncertain. I feel like what you really, what you really show so beautifully is to lead with that vulnerability and especially as a man. So how can we, especially parts of our stories that we may feel shameful about or embarrassed about, How can we take that and turn that into art? Mm. Well, I I believe that the the key to understand is is I actually think that art is a technology. I believe that art is a technology and I believe it is the highest leverage way that we actually shift human consciousness. And the reason why I believe this is because true shifts in human consciousness and as a person, like when you really change something, there is, it has to happen in your emotional body. It has, it, there is an emotional component that is always associated with a major shift in your consciousness. And sometimes that can be awful, right? Like a total breakdown, I, I, ego death experience. And sometimes it can be a, an experience of oneness or connection or love that's deeper than you've ever felt before. But there's a shift that happens emotionally. And the thing is that even as I'm speaking right now, I recognize that everyone listening to this, it's filtering through their lens of the logical mind. There is a, a, part of them that's going, do I agree with what Adam is saying right now? Do I actually, do I resonate with that? And if the answer is yes, okay, great. And then he says something else. Okay. Do I agree with that? Yeah, I do. And if I say enough things that they're resonating with, they, we have created rapport. And now at a certain stage, maybe I say something and it, and it hits deep right away, which is why, by the way, the, the things that our, our family says to us can cut so deep. Someone else could say it and we don't care, but our mom or dad says that thing and it just so deep is because we have that deep level of rapport over years that has been built. And so we let them into our emotional bodies um, more readily. And yet, you know, despite the fact that we have a society that seems to be set up to make it easy to avoid the, the discomfort, right? Let's numb out through processed foods and sugars and social media, et cetera, et cetera. Art is the permission slip that people, people have to feel. If someone believes that something is a piece of art, they are going to go into that experience expecting to feel something. You put on your favorite, you put on your music because of how it makes you feel. You go into a movie theater because of how you think that movie is going to make you feel. And so even the most shut down human being who doesn't normally want to feel is listening to music or watching movies or experiencing art of some kind because of how it makes them feel. And so knowing that the transformation happens at the feeling level, here we have this technology to bypass the mind and go right into the the heart, right into the feelings. And so This process for me is so important to understand because the depth at which you can reach someone is the depth that you're willing to show your own heart. 
what, what vulnerability is the gateway to connection. So when I actually create a piece of art, if I'm unwilling to let you see my wounds, my scars, my, the parts I judge, if I'm not letting, willing to let you see that, there's only so far I can penetrate into your own emotional body. And so I'm here because I want to help people transform. My, what drives me is I was not this person. I didn't actually think of myself as a creative person. I didn't think of myself as an artist. I did not. I was shut down emotionally. I, my father's from the Philippines. I had a very stoic Asian role model uh, as, as a father who emotions were not safe in my home. And so I didn't know how to do this. And I learned how to do this and transformed my own life. And I'm so passionate that if I can do it, anyone can do it. And so that is why I think that the understanding and, and why I answered the question in that way is I do it because I recognize what's possible from the impact when I'm willing to show up that vulnerably. That's what drives me. Not because it's not uncomfortable. It's definitely uncomfortable to be that vulnerable, to make my reality show, The Art of Choosing Love on, on YouTube. And like, basically it's me crying all over the world after a breakup after 10 years and, and just wanting to show people what the healing journey looks like after a breakup with being with someone for 10 years and feeling like a 40 year old virgin, like not even knowing how to date. Like Instagram wasn't even a thing when we started dating. I was 23 when I met her. I was 33 when we broke up. Like, I, I, I didn't know what to do, but I knew that if I could just show people that I was doing my best and show it to them as real as possible, that was how to make the biggest impact, not from the structure of it or the like logical idea of it, but just opening up to that depth. And, and I think if people recognize that that is what actually penetrates more deeply, it gives more purpose behind why would someone share vulnerably? And so that, mm. that really is, is how I get there. I love that so much because we do, even just those little snippets of your story, you, story you shared in that it helps us understand you in such a deeper way and gain more curiosity of like, Oh, tell me more about that breakup. Tell me more about your relationship with your father. And we so readily feel this with other people, but for whatever reason, we feel like, oh, well, maybe people don't care about my story or my story is not that important or I'm not good at telling it or we haven't yet connected the piece of the dot. So it doesn't really feel like the story arc the same way that someone who's a storyteller may tell. So if you are, you know, someone listening to this podcast that does want to help people and does want to share their story, but maybe feels like, I don't know how, I don't know how to make it interesting for people. What advice do you have? <sighs> well, there's a, there's a lot of pieces to that, actually. Uh, the first one being, just start, to be honest. Uh, I, I really think that so... I, I operate by rapid prototyping. The Tom Chi um, was a engineer at, at Google, and he coined this term rapid prototyping, which is just, you'll learn more from doing than planning. And so... I like to say, if you want to know how to become more interesting in, in telling your story, for example, be more effective in how to do that, start doing it and, and learn what works and what doesn't work. The caveat to this is when we're talking about sharing our stories and, and our personal journeys, we, it's important for us to have the discernment of where is the safe space to do that. It is not everywhere and with everyone. That's actually an unsafe thing to do. And as a result, you can cause more wounding, more trauma. You can um, reinforce the belief that no one cares about your story or it's not safe to share your story because you pick the wrong places or people or situations to share it in. And so this is why, I mean, you have your, your community and I have my community, like all, the, all of us are leading communities because we understand the power of them. When you have a safe space to express, when you have a safe space to be seen, when you have a safe space to try out something new, that is so critical. And um, I encourage people to find the safe space as a first step. Find the, the place that you feel safe to do it and then start doing it. Start sharing more of yourself. Start 
um, sharing more of your art. Find the unique way in which your story gets to be expressed. If you want to, I consider myself a really great storyteller and and artist in that way. But something that I want to make sure people understand is I trained and studied in that. I was an actor in Los Angeles, uh, writer, director, producer. I've, I've read so many books on story. I've read hundreds of scripts, performed thousands of scenes, um, you know, directed music videos and web series. I have a background of, as a studied storyteller. And so there's a lot that can go into the craft of storytelling. Absolutely. And how you ultimately want to express it you got to find the love for it first, right? Don't study the craft of guitar playing until you start playing the guitar. You don't need to worry about how to craft your story until you just start, like start, start getting comfortable sharing, find the safe spaces. Mm, I love that. And yeah, just, we, we learn so much by telling the story and then we kind of feel into how did that person respond for me telling the story or what are people more curious about in my story? And and also the more healing we do, it connects those dots that we didn't realize that that random, you know, fight that I had with someone was related to this breakthrough that I had three years later on. And we're like, oh, wow. And the story changes as we do. So I feel like so often we think, well, I don't have like a cool story, but it's really just those people telling their stories have done that introspective work of connecting the dots. So it sounds like this, like, beginning, middle, end, but really there were many years and many moments that were not said in that story. It's just that they're telling you those that are the most, you know, beneficial for you to get the point. Yeah. And when you think about movies, for example, and TV shows, one description I love, I've always loved is, is movies are uh, real life with the boring parts taken out. And so, you know, you go from one scene where something pivotal is happening to another scene where that something's happening to another scene, but in between that might've been a week, like in, yeah. in, even in that reality over there was a week of time where they just went to work and they came home and then they, you know, made some dinner and they fed their dogs and took the dog on the walk and then went to bed and nothing really happened. But a week later, this thing happened and we just jump from scene to scene. We all have that. If we were to just look at your highlight reels of where things happened in your life, like you have a story. Some people have far more interesting ones. Absolutely. And if, if you want that to be you, great. Go and live an interesting life. How do you live an interesting life? Push your edges. That's You, you want to become more interesting. Push the edges of your fears and your doubts and your insecurities, do the work to uncover what was it that caused me to think that I couldn't do this in the first place. Let me step out of this. I, I recently went to ISTA. Um, mm -hmm. Are you familiar with ISTA? Yeah. So for people who don't know, ISTA is the International School of Temple Arts. It's, it's like a Tantra school, um, jokingly referred to as sex camp by my facilitator uh, in Costa Rica. And I, I went to that and I've been studying Tantra probably for like six, the last six years, but I'd never been in, and I'd worked with facilitators and different things, but I'd never been in a container quite like ISTA where legitimately at, at night, they open it up to something called temple where people are just like, can just be having sex. It could turn into a giant orgy. Like so, there's so many things that can happen. There's no real, there are some rules, but you get my point. I'd never been in that sort of scenario before. And so when, let me go and just push those edges. Let me see what I can uncover about myself. And by doing things like that consistently, I become a more interesting person. I have more interesting stories. I have more depth of insight into myself. I have more interesting insight into sociologically other human beings. And I have more things that I could actually engage in conversation with different types of people with. Now, I inherently will have more cool stories to tell as a result of that. So when thinking about how do I tell my story in a more interesting way, yes, we address that. But two, how are you being the most interesting version of yourself? What is that? How, how are you living your life right now to be pushing your edges and be evolving in a way that is inspiring? 
that is intriguing that I want to ask questions like how, what was the sex camp? What was that like? Mm. You know, those sorts of things. And I love how it's a choice, right? Like there's aspects of your story that were not your choice, like the family you grew up with, you know, conditions, but going to sex camp, that's a, that's a choice that you made and makes it so interesting. And I'm like, and I want to ask you 50 more questions. Like for me, like moving to India, that was a, a choice. It didn't have to happen. So I think for so many people, they're like waiting for something interesting to happen. Or, you know, I made it to this point in my life. So I guess all the cool experiences I could have had are in my past, but to, to consistently make that choice of how am I being my most interesting self and pushing those boundaries and pushing those edges. So I'd love to know what did being at sex camp teach you about creativity? (laughs) Well, um, what did it teach me about creativity? It taught me a lot about my own blockages around my sexual energy specifically. Mm -hmm. Uh, I have, so I was molested at the age of five and It was a repressed memory that I didn't remember until I was 30 years old. So for about 25 years of my life, I moved through the world interacting in a way that where like one, the story that I took on, for example, was that sexual energy is unsafe. Being, being the object of sexual desire can cause pain. Um, That men's sexual desire is uncontrollable because it was a man um, those sorts of stories that laid dormant in my unconscious. Cause I couldn't even remember the memory. And so you can imagine I have been someone for most of my life that has shied away from sexual energy, the sexual energy. When I've been, when women have brought intense sexual energy to me, I've felt very uncomfortable. Actually. Uh, I haven't liked being, uh, pursued very strongly in that way. And I haven't actually pursued very strongly or felt comfortable with my own energy because I didn't unconsciously, I didn't want to be the man that caused so much pain. And so going to, to ISTA and having this experience where I realized that my sexual energy specifically and how I hold it and how I communicate about it and, and interact with women around that can be a huge gift when held in a really conscious way. A man's sexual energy can be one of the most healing gifts that he can give because especially on this planet right now with so much pain that has been caused by unconscious male sexual energy and the wounding around male sexuality that has led to, oh, I'm just going to take it. I'm just going to to rape and assault and just um, suppress and all of these things as a result of that to be able to interact and relate between a man and woman in a way where I can, I can hold it with consciousness and, and bring that to the space creates a new reference point and can, and I experienced it in real time, how healing that can be. And so that aspect for me brought a whole new level of embodiment and confidence into me moving through the world, actually having my sexual energy readily available and being willing to exchange in it and not mean having sex, but even being willing to flirt or make more eye contact or whatever that might be by being able to bring that into the world that is unlocking more life force in me right? I, I, I'm talking about how it may funnel into sexuality, but actually what it is, is just moving through the world with more uh, life force because I'm not suppressing a bunch of it. And then I can move that and channel it into creativity. Mm, so beautifully said. And I think we can all really resonate with shutting down our sexual energy because we don't want to come off as, you know, for a woman, like asking for it or getting uncomfortable attention from someone or, you know, all of the different ways that that can be funneled. And then the ways that we shut ourselves down and make ourselves small and dim ourselves. And I know for a lot of women, like almost act cold and and mean and, and manly even to be like, no, I am not sexually available. And then that 
you know, the way that we embody energy is the way that we're going to create and the way that we're going to show up in the world. I remember living in India. It's almost like if you make eye contact with the man on the street, you want to fuck him. That's how they might take it. So mm-hmm. I'm like walking down the street with this like bitch face on and looking down on the floor and no eye contact. So I'm not going to like open up the moment I get inside the room and be like super shakti and creative. I'm still going to be embodied in that energy of, of shutdown and walls around us. And I think so many of us are constantly living in that space, especially if you're in an office or, you know, in, in corporate where it's almost like, oh, if you make a little bit too long of eye contact, like that's unprofessional. Mm, I know this episode is good, but so is this sponsor. So if you're anything like me, you have trouble sometimes easing into your evening routine because you can be so wired with work. And this is why I love Rasa. So they are adaptogen herbal blends for every mood that you desire. I love their calm, which has creamy notes of dates and vanilla with a hint of cacao, as well as their spicy rose cacao, which really tastes like a hot chocolate with some ginger and rose, as well as their super happy sunshine, which actually supports serotonin and dopamine production in your brain. So if you've been wanting to get more ashwagandha, mycelium, rhodiola, reishi, shatavari, hishi, wu, and all the good stuff into your nutrition without taking tons of supplements, then Rasa is for you. They even have a quiz on their website to find the perfect blend for you. So you can get 20% off your first purchase with code Sahara at wearerasa.com. Again, that's promo code Sahara for 20% off at wearerasa, R-A-S-A.com. And that link is in the show notes. How can we now open ourselves up to playing with that sexual energy without maybe making other people feel uncomfortable? Well, this is a, this is a really interesting question. And, and I think a conversation that is evolving right now in the collective. I, I feel as if there is a renegotiation of how to relate, how men and women are relating. There's a, a renegotiation happening. And there is a rise of the divine feminine that is very clearly happening on this planet. And um, I think that's amazing. And at the same time, I also recognize that there, it can very easily shift into um, women wielding wounded masculine energy. And so that is an interesting nuance, even in and of itself, is this wounded masculine that feels like, like I I have felt not powerful and therefore I'm just going to take, right? And Mm -hmm. I've seen that exact thing happen on on the other side amongst women who have felt like they've been shut down and they haven't been powerful. And now it's like, well, we're just going to take it. And, and so it's, it is a renegotiation. And I think that quite honestly, it, it always starts with, can I be in right relationship with my own sexual energy? And as odd as that may sound or as simplistic, or maybe, you know, um, too fundamentally basic, but I don't know too many people who have great relationships with their own sexual energy. Mm -hmm. It's, it is a very small percentage, even within the quote unquote conscious community. There are so many people that have been in personal development for a decade and done all the plant medicine work and all of the things, and yet are in relationships where the part they're like in a marriage where they don't, they don't speak about sex openly. They don't talk about their deep desires. They don't, they don't bring those things up because they don't want to rock the boat. There, there are so many, and that's, that's within conscious relationships. And so I think that coming into right relationship with our own sexual energy and getting to a space in which we are not ashamed of it, we don't feel guilt around it, we feel empowered in our desires and the ability to, to voice them, that level of ownership of us as sexual beings is going to translate out into how we communicate with each other. And in that, it's like I was speaking earlier, by me being in right relationship with my own sexual energy, I now have the ability to relate with women in a way that creates a new reference point that they may not have experienced before. And that now, upon having that experience, it's like, oh, 
in my next relationship with the next man that I date, I'm going to request a certain level of communication. I'm going to request a certain level of aftercare after the next um, time I sleep with someone new for the first time. And, and all of these things that can um, be new standards that we hold, but they can only happen through, like that's only possible for me to even do because I've come into right relationship within myself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think it's dropping the scarcity of, well, if I have those needs, then there won't be anyone left for me. You know, I think a lot of people, especially with women, but probably with men too, but the conversation with women is there's no conscious men, you know? So if I desire someone who's embodied and tantric and, you know, in his masculine, like I'm going to be left alone forever. So I should, you know, lower my standards. So what do you say to women who are feeling like that, who feel like maybe I'm just too conscious to find a man? Yeah, that's a protection mechanism. That That is a, a protection mechanism uh, around the, the insecurities and fears of not being ultimately desired or, or having someone claim you, right? Mm -hmm. uh, because there, let's, let's speak to the factual which is there are more women in the conscious personal development space than men, 100%. That is, that is a fact. Uh, that is shifting though. And there are a lot of conscious men. And the thing that I want to remind women of, and this is the nature of the feminine, by the way, which is the masculine wants to provide for you. The, the, the masculine wants to meet you. The masculine wants to give you whatever the hell you want. That is, that is the design of the masculine. We are here to fill you literally, figuratively, all the ways. And the feminine is the pull, the, the pulling in, you are the magnet. And so basically what I mean is everything that men do is for women. Ultimately, at the end of the day, we are wanting to meet you. We are wanting to be desired by you. We are wanting all of those things because that is the divine design of the yin and yang energies. Now, with that said, let's make it known to men what you want. Let's make it known to men what you're looking for. Let's make it known to men how attractive it is for them to be able to be vulnerable, how attractive it is for them to have emotional intelligence and the communication skills to be able to voice what's going on inside of them while it's happening instead of shutting down, retreating, or becoming angry. Like when that becomes understood by men that that's what you want, that is going to 100% have an impact on, on how men act. And it's also important to... It's also important with how it's framed. I hear that all the time. Where are all the conscious men? It's, it's somewhat insulting. It's somewhat insulting as a man to be like, where are all the conscious men? It's like, I, I'm actually, I, I could probably list 50, like now. And I, I do think that there's an idea within what I've seen, and maybe I'm going to trigger people here. Let's, let's go there. But I do feel like there's an idea that somehow uh, women are, like I've experienced women, let's put it this way. I'm trying to be, how I say this, I have experienced some women in relationship that and, and going on dates where these women have said that sort of thing where it's like, I can't find a man to meet me, blah, blah. And then when I experience them, they are showing up in ways that I would say are actually very immature and from like a, a consciousness, spiritual standpoint. There's a lot of wounding, a lot of needing to prove still in the masculine energy of like proving my worth as a queen and all of these, these things, these dynamics. And so these, this woman is someone who's actively out in the world saying, where are all the conscious men? And then myself, when I show up, like I'm, I may not, I'm not perfect, but I'm definitely a conscious male. And I'm definitely aware of what I bring to the table and who I am and the value that I provide, et cetera, et cetera. And when in relationship with you, I experience something that feels really not great. 
beyond just incompatibility from an actual, this is, this is coming from a wound. This is projection. This is actually not the, the type of conscious relating that I would coach people on or, or welcome into my life. And so there is an aspect of that, that I find in a lot of women specifically of this idea that they're at a certain place that men can't meet them, but their vision of where they are has, isn't, entirely accurate. And I think that goes for everyone. I take ownership of that even within myself. And I just want to make that, that point because I don't know how many men are actually willing to go out on a limb and actually point this out and say this that directly. Well, thank you for sharing that. And I think that that's really great feedback because most people would probably go date to date. And then for whatever reason, it's not working out. So they have in their mind, oh, he wasn't conscious enough for me rather than whatever they were, you know, doing in their energy that may have been repelling people. And it's sort of like how women often, when they are abandoned, they take on the independent woman personality of, I don't need a man. I'm good on my own. That like what you just said, I just thought about it in spirituality. It's like, I am a queen. I am beautiful and perfect. And, and it's beautiful. It's like, that is one stage of the healing journey to be like, yes, I am the goddess. Like, yes, I deserve <laughs> it all. But then if it's just like seeing the affirmations and not actually embodying them and believing them, then it can have that like protection mechanism around that, like, oh, well, if, if he didn't show up exactly how I wanted, it's because he's not ready for a queen like me rather <laughs> than, you know, whatever, whatever yeah. the thing is, incompatibility, et cetera. Yeah. And, and I had a uh, Stefano Sifindos on my yeah. podcast, uh, the deep dive podcast. And we asked the question, um, are men sick of dating spiritual women? Ooh. And that was the question we dove into on my podcast. And the because, and that stemmed from, I visited Austin and I was in a group of, of four or five conscious men. And we were all sharing that we were kind of sick of dating inside the conscious community because of a lot of be behavior patterns that we were noticing that were really freaking annoying, like the spiritual bypass, super common in there. And it comes from this place of, I, I, the, what you just said, like, I'm a queen, I'm a goddess, et cetera. And therefore, if we disagree, you're not meeting me here at this level or whatever. And the, the word, and then it becomes wrapped in spiritual jargon and wording and different things that just feels patronizing. Mm. And it was interesting to bring, to voice this and hear four other men voice the same thing. And it's a very fine line because I also recognize that it comes from this beautiful space of women feeling empowered, feeling empowered, feel, owning their worth, claiming their desire. Like there is a beauty that's happening where it's stemming from, but there is a balance that gets to be struck that it's like, I imagine if you're a superhero and you just came up to new, your superpowers, you don't know how to control them yet. And you're just like, they're, they're, um, yeah, there's like a maturing of those superpowers. And, and I feel like, uh, that's happening on both sides uh, for the masculine and the feminine. Yeah. I think, and exactly what you said of, we're figuring out the right way of relating to each other that I could see the perspective of, well, maybe men just aren't used to women claiming their power. And I also see the perspective of when you're empowered, you don't need to keep telling people, right. You just, <laughs> are. So it's like, it's that fine line of knowing, you know, what's, what's right for you. And I, and I also see a lot of women with the conscious men, cause I hear the opposite of like, I'm sick of dating the conscious men of the spiritual bypassing of them, not being in their masculine of all of them being polyamorous. That's a big one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. And, and also that there's a lot of processing happening often when there's like two people in a conscious relationship, you know, they, they have all these tools and they want to bring out their whiteboard every time there's a fight. And for a lot of people, it's like, again, we could get used to that and that could become our new normal and our new way of relating. Maybe we're just not used to it. And and here's what we need. Or it's like taking everything maybe really seriously of like, oh, I am conscious. So there must be a process of how we move through every single thing. And are we okay that it's like chill, like live your life. So guilty. yeah, wh what's your guilty. take on I was that? Like, guilty. I, I have, I was definitely that person 
for many, many years, I was in a 10 year relationship and I was 100% that person. And part of that is, you know, when you get really excited about something, you want to like teach it. It's yeah. so common. I, I, I don't know. I know you coach and, and there's people get are brand new to spirituality or awakening or personal development, but, and they see so many shifts happening that there's this natural desire to want to share it and teach it and, mm-hmm. and that sort of thing. And, and that's very, very common with anything. Oh, I love guitar. And now I want to play it everywhere. And I want to like do this and this, and there, there's a desire to share it out. And, um, so I think that applies to relationships. And I, and I think that there's a, wow, I've never related consciously before. And like all of the things I've learned in personal development, I want to bring into my relationship. And there's an excitement there. I don't think it comes from, from a bad place at all. And um, where I feel like I am now, because my spiritual awakening really happened in 2013. So it was like nine years ago. Um, and in the time since then to now and the different relationships I've had and and learnings, I can say that I don't desire that in my relationship because I see that happening, like the growth happening naturally, just based on who we are. We don't have to bring the structure of let's dive into every wound thing, et cetera, with the whiteboard but that's what it was initially for me. And that's what I mean when I say there's a level of sort of maturity that I think happens. Um, and, and I, and I can see where I was really immature with it from a place of excitement, thinking it was more beneficial, but then I found myself in these loops of processing, Mm -hmm. just processing over and over because the truth is that we are always going to have growth. We're always going to come up against our limiting beliefs, fears, doubts, insecurities, especially if you're living at the edge of your consciousness. And in relationship, the person that you're with is your greatest mirror. And therefore, they are going to reflect all of those things back to you, whether you like it or not. And so how you be with that is actually a conscious choice and decision as a couple that you you get to determine. And if you're not careful, it can just become a giant personal development workshop nonstop. And that's exhausting. And so I know that for for myself, it's taken me a pretty long time to get here, I'd say. Mm. Uh, But um, I am glad to be here and, and have the awareness of what I do desire moving forward now. Yeah. And I think with every relationship, it's so different for some people, like they may both be coaches and the whiteboard is like their savior. And for other people, it just may feel like too much work, or maybe you're coaching people all the time that you just don't want to have that in your relationship. So it is definitely a trial and error. So I'd love to ask you, since we're on this topic, a lot of women, they meet conscious men and they're beautiful people, but one thing I need to be polyamorous. And for the (laughs) woman, it doesn't feel true to her. It's not something that she wants. And at the same time, you know, she starts to question, like, am I, am I stuck in this old relationship model? Maybe I should be open to it, but she also feels like maybe she's like fighting against her heart or her biology. Um, so I'd love to know what's your take on that. Is it something that you're kind of born with? Do you think polyamorous monogamous or, a uh, relational thing that changes over time. I believe that um, the n- nature of someone uh, is definitely a factor. So compersion. Um, compersion means that you get pleasure from your partner's pleasure, from seeing someone else's pleasure. So this is where um, I'm launching a new, a new podcast called You're Too Much with Taylor Simpson. Mm. And the two of us are are doing this and one of the episodes is actually titled, I want to see my husband fuck another woman. Mm. And Taylor has so much compersion and really a lack of jealousy to the point where that's her experience. She wants to see her husband have sex with another woman. And, and that's exciting to her. There's no part of her that contracts around that. That is not most people's experience. Mm. Now, I imagine some of that is some sort of biological aspect, sure. And some part of that is actually the environment that she grew up in and around and the various different aspects of childhood development. 
But I do think that to some degree, you can learn some of those skills. You can learn how to find the pleasure in your partner's pleasure. You can recognize that underneath the fact that you're like, there's no way, there might actually be a huge piece of jealousy. There may be a huge fear that they they would leave you and fall in love with someone else. And so the question really becomes that I encourage people to ask when they're in that conversation around polyamory or whatever is the reason why I'm a no to this or a yes to this, where is it coming from? Is my come from actually, I'm afraid that they're going to fall in love with someone else and leave me. Great. Then it doesn't mean that you're necessarily against polyamory. You're just living through a relational lens that has a lot of fear in it. That's, that's the reality in which you're viewing your partner is that if given the option, they would leave you. That's, that's, that's a fear. And so for me, I'm not polyamorous. I actually, you know, I've tried various types of relating, but I, I am a monogamous person. I desire to meet my queen, have a, a family and a, and a nest, et cetera. And it'll be great to, to go to play parties or occasionally bring uh, another woman into the bedroom or something like that. But, but I desire a definitely primarily monogamous container. And that's through exploration. And the reason I desire that is not because I'm afraid of them actually leaving me for someone else. I've explored that uh, tremendously. I'm, I want that because I want the depth that comes from this person and I are lifing together. And in polyamory, it's not like, oh, I have three girlfriends. You have and they each get one third of my time, you have three full-time relationships. And so I don't personally find even the bandwidth. I'm not even sure how you do that, let alone go to the same level of depth. And I'm more interested in the depth personally. Mm. Yeah, I think it's definitely, you know, that's interesting with Taylor because I, what I find is maybe people who pull more to the masculine tend to have more of like that desire or capacity to even be polyamorous. It's not something I typically see heterosexual women in. So it's, that's really interesting with, with Taylor. She does have a strong pit of fire energy in her. So I wonder if well, that could be connected because, to it. You know, uh, my partner of 10 years, uh, was, is very feminine in a, in a lot of ways. And she also just no jealousy bone and, and got turned on by that idea. Mm. I was so insecure in my own sexuality, believe it or not, that I just never even acted on it or, or we never went that direction. Um, but the, it is something that, that some people have. And I, and I think that, um, if you can identify what is underneath it in both directions, Mm-hmm. What is underneath it? Because for some people, it may be they want that aspect of of whatever, and they think that it's. Yeah, I, I hate when polyamorous people seem to think that it's a more evolved state of being. That that right. really is annoying to me. But the there are people who are going into polyamory because they have fear of intimacy, or they have fear mm-hmm. of commitment, and they're afraid of their partner leaving. And instead of trying to control, they actually try and just have a bunch of different options. It's still the same thing. There's still a fear driving it. And so ultimately when we can identify my way that I move through the world is if I can identify that there's a fear that's responsible for how I'm acting or showing up in some way, I'm going to adjust. I'm Mm going to, I'm going to address that thing. I'm going to move it because I refuse to let fear be the, the foundational energy underneath any of my actions. If I'm aware of it. Mm -hmm. I think there's also you know, maybe based off of evolution for women and for men, like if a woman was pregnant, you didn't necessarily know whose baby it was. So if a woman was having sex with multiple people, the man wouldn't know if that was his seed. So I think that's why there is this like biological desire to like have your woman to yourself and to only mate with one partner because to know like that is for sure my child. 
Yeah, well, what's interesting is I've heard it also said the other way, where one of the benefits of like certain tribes where they're all kind of having sex and it's very open, whatever, is that because you don't know which child is yours, the entire village is incentivized to take care of everyone's children as if they're mm. their own. Right? But what tribes, I'm curious, like where where in the world is that the case? Are I think any- it's, it's far more rare. I'm trying to remember what book it was from. Is it Sex at Dawn? I think Sex at Dawn talks about it, but I'm not sure. Because I've heard that too, but I'm like, I'm curious because marriage is just such a part of almost every culture. Like well, some marriage- form of, not marriage, the institution, but like- yeah choosing your partner and, and lifing with them. Yeah. I'm, I would say that that's far more normalized. I would say the other aspect is not the the common thing. It's not like tribes everywhere are doing that. Mm -hmm. Um, I do think partnering and that has its own biological implications around the fact that basically human babies are the most vulnerable of pretty much any species. Uh, so the necessity of having a protector of that baby. Um, and I honestly, I honestly think that what is most important is for people to find their truth, right? Like I, I do feel like there are polyamorous couples that I'm sure are incredibly happy and, and find a way to make it work. I don't know many, and I know a lot of people who've tried polyamory. It's not the easiest thing to do. And mo- I would say seven, I would probably say 85% of the polyamorous people that I know in my life have either one gone away from polyamory or two had are in a great deal of drama and not really healthy dynamics. And it's, it's mm-hmm. causing a lot of issues. Mm-hmm. It's rare for me to meet polyamorous couples that are thriving where I look at them and go, wow, that's a great model that other people should really be aware of. I meet far more of those in the, um, the monogamous space. However, I'll also add that there's not I mean, look at the divorce rates and and the unhealthy, unconscious relating that's out there too. I don't know how many monogamous couples are out there that are actually role models for what I personally would want in my life either. Mm, yeah, and that's why it just comes down to healing. I think it's, you know, you can have, you can find those same traumas playing out in real time in monogamy or in polyamory. It's just like pick whichever <laughs> model that you desire. And I think too, with the polyamory, like, it, it's such a new topic and so many people are exploring it. So there is that element of like, is this the next step of evolution for humanity? Is this the more conscious thing? But I know for myself, like when I just feel into it, it's just a body-based no for me. Mm-hmm. Um, so I wonder what is your advice for people who maybe they, for women specifically, maybe they meet a man and he's everything they've wanted on their list, but he's polyamorous. Do you think that they should give it a try? Or do you think if it, if the immediate response was a no, they should just stick with that? I think the immediate response needs to be explored. So, and that doesn't mean you have to go and date that person. I mean, in your own internal inquiry of like, woo, that's a no. Okay. Why? Mm -hmm. Why is that the initial response? And is that coming from a fear or is that actually coming from a place of empowerment? there's no right or wrong answer to that. It's not like you become so healed in your own, all of your wounds. And now you want to be polyamorous because all your jealousy is gone. That's not, that's not the design of it. You may heal all your wounds and different things and have been polyamorous and no longer want to be after that. Right. Again, figuring that out, but that initial starting place of, okay, I'm honoring what my body says and I get to actually go into it. And ideally we're finding the, the situation you're finding a partner in which you're able to explore that together. You're able to have the conversation. You're able to say, why do you want to be polyamorous? Like, why is that important to you? What is the values? What is it that you're worried about? Or what is it that you want to maintain? What is it that you think you give up in a monogamous relationship? Have those conversations. If you can't even have those conversations on both ends, then I don't know that you're you're really in the type of conscious relationship that you want to be in anyway. And if you can't have that type of conversation with someone who wants to be polyamorous, that's a huge red flag because polyamory requires an even greater level of communication, not less. 
Mm, so true. Yeah. That communication piece is so important. People think polyamory is just like, oh, you get to have sex with whoever you want. And like all the boyfriends, all the girlfriends, but no, it's like a lot of really tough conversations and, you know, meeting your, your jealousy or your feeling of left out again and again and again. And, and for some people, I think that's their life path that they choose to grow from of like, Mm -hmm. I want to learn from that. And for other people, it's like, no, I'm going to learn from this other life path. And that's just like, not the thing I want to spend all my time on. It's hard. It's been hard enough for me just dating. Yeah. (laughs) Just like dating a few people at the same time. It's just, I'm just, I don't know how a polyamorous thing. I just can't. Um, So navigating everyone's experiences. And so kudos to to people who do it well. Mm. So before we let you go, I would love if you could share one of your spoken word pieces. Any that you feel fit in this, in this conversation. (laughs) Yeah. What what would fit into the polyamorous conversation? (laughs) Or creativity, self-love, feminine, masculine, polarity. Let me do, since we're talking about the masculine and feminine, uh, I want to start there. I think that that would be a really uh, beautiful one to offer here uh, because, you know, I learned a lot about, uh, about the masculine and feminine and the aspect that I spoke to in here, which is the, the fact that the masculine wants to give, you know, like the masculine always wants to fill the needs of the feminine as best as we possibly can. But sometimes that isn't actually what the feminine needs. (laughs) And so, um, I wrote this poem immediately following a breakup where that was my lesson. And this poem is called us. Have everyone take a nice deep inhale and exhale. You asked, how can I know you love me? How can I trust in us? I said, don't you worry, my dear, I will give you the heavens above. I wanted to give you the moon, but you said it was not bright enough. So I tried to give you the sun, but you said it was too hot to touch. So I searched and searched for something that could keep you warm at night, that could help you find your way, that could be your guiding light. The stars too small, but I tried to collect them all. I moved mountains to ease your path. I put a ring of Saturn on each of your fingers, which was no easy task. Picked out every piece of salt so the whole ocean could be your bath. Spent all day sweeping clouds away so it wouldn't rain unless you asked. Caught lightning in a bottle, learned how to speak into the wind, hoping that each time I said, I love you, you might finally breathe it in. But it seemed like no matter what I did, something never was quite right. The fire kept on burning out and with it went the light. So tired, worn and weary, I finally gave up, came to you, asked for a clue. Why was none of it enough? You smiled sadly at me then, kissed my cheek, a gentle touch, said, I can see you tried so hard. You have given me so much, but you never needed to do those things. I never asked for any of them. It was you who pulled down Saturn's rings and cleaned out all the oceans. All I wanted was some warmth to know I'm safe when times get hard, a light to help me find my way back home when times get dark. So while the moon was dim and the sun too hot, you've had the answer from the start, deep within what can't be bought, what I wanted was your heart. And on that day, I learned a lesson that I hope I can pass to you. So the next time you're asked that question, how do I know our love is true? you'll know that the answer is in all the little things you do. It's the way you listen to her breathe when she falls asleep at night. It's how you never make her wrong even when she isn't right. It's how you never shy away from her eyes when they're full of rage. She feels safe to scream until she cries because you're there to wipe her tears away. It's the way you rest your hand so gently around her hips, so other women can clearly see he's proud that she is his. There's a warmth in feeling claimed. She knows you won't give up without a fight. 
That's how she knows she can trust your love. That's how your heart becomes her light. Mm, so beautiful. Wow. I just felt mm -hmm. that and, and such a beautiful reminder of the little ways that we show love in an, in an everyday living experience rather than feeling like we need to go to Saturn and <laughs> get all the rings. So <laughs> absolutely. So beautifully expressed. Thank you for that. You're welcome. Yeah, that was, that one was deeply earned. Let's put it that way. I, I earned that lesson. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I think I would, for me, I was so busy in the doing of trying to prove my love that I didn't create the space to really hear what was needed from her. And um, yeah, I think that's a, a very common thing that, mm -hmm. that, that happens. So Thank you for putting that into words and for everything that you shared on the podcast today. So where can listeners connect with you further and be part of your year of art that is coming this year? <laughs> yeah, I'll be really soon. I, I'm going to be finishing my first ever poetry book this year and, and all of the things. So I'm very excited. Um, you can find me online. I have lots of online real estate. So adam.roa on Instagram. Adam Roa on Facebook, uh, YouTube, et cetera. I have a podcast called The Deep Dive with Adam Roa. And I also have a podcast launching with Taylor Simpson called You're Too Much. Uh, and then I have an online personal development community, thecreatecommunity.com and adamroa.com. You can find mm -hmm. your way there. Well, thank you again so much for sharing your wisdom, your art and your creativity with us today. We're so grateful. Yeah. Thank you for having me, Sarah. I really appreciate it. This has been a great conversation. We went all over the place. So yes. Beautiful. <laughs> thank you everyone for listening. Oh my goddess. My heart is just blasted open from that beautiful poetry and the words and the meaning behind them. It is so beautiful what us humans can create with our artistry and creating all of our life experiences and transmuting them into art is, is truly our highest potential and why we are here as humans. We are here to create. So thank you for being part of this incredible journey. I love this conversation. We went so many places and that's what I love about the podcast. Like we get to keep it real. We get to talk about creativity and polyamory and spiritual relationships and everything in between. And it's just, I love having conversations with this. Adam is actually good friend of mine, but sometimes I feel like I get to know people better on the podcast than I actually even get to talk to, to them in real life because you just don't really quite go there. So thank you for being our third in this conversation and for keeping your heart open in these times. I'm so grateful for you being here and I'll see you in the next one. Namaste. Namaste.